was introduced by finance minister mr p chidambaram while presenting the budget for 2013 14 while proposing the scheme it was stated that out of 17 lakh registered assessee under service tax only 7 lakh are filing returns fm further stated that many have simply stopped filing returns and we cannot go after each of them so i have to motivate them to file returns and pay their taxes tax dues so aiming to incentivize the persons to pay up service tax dues owed to the exchequer and for widening revenue from indirect tax a one time scheme called voluntary compliance encouragement scheme was proposed it has finally been passed giving relief to those who have bypassed the service tax law it is a significant step towards offering persons an opportunity to pay outstanding service tax dues to the government without incurring penalties and giving immunity from interest which is uncommon and other proceedings in the process viewing the scheme from one side it appears to be extremely attractive for defaulters to comply with on the other hand there is a feeling that while the scheme scheme seeks to provide immunity to those who have paid service tax it offers little respite to honest taxpayers another view is that such an amnesty scheme reflects weak enforcement capabilities of the government if that be the case then the entire objective bent spreading the service tax base would be fatal if the government does not possess the required infrastructure or capabilities to cast the service tax net widely leaving this at controversy aside the reality is that in order to streamline streamline its implementation service tax uh, voluntary compliance scheme rule 2013 and circular clarifying various aspects of the scheme have been notified on going through the scheme as well as the rules we find that various issues are not addressed and also many doubts and questions arises that needs consideration foremost among them is who can participate in the scheme how the non registered assessees can avail the benefit and pay their service tax dues what about persons who have filed their returns and paid their taxes honestly and genuinely but due to some genuine reasons fail to pay complete amount of service tax whether refund can be claimed of an amount paid as per declaration if later on found to be in excess what are the options available to ssc's whose liability was only for financial year 6 7 and has duly paid their service tax within the set financial year but has not submitted a single st3 return till date how to avail senvet credit uh, needless to add the real utility of the scheme to person is dependent on the manner in which the scheme is actually implemented in practice and that aspect remains to be seen nonetheless the overall tenor and the design of the scheme seem to be that of a well intended amnesty offering so friends to know what are the catches in this vca scheme passed is it a motivational scheme is it extremely defaulter friendly uh, to find out answers to all this we have this evening mr sunil gabawala with us Uh, Sunil Khabawala is a chartered accountant in practice with third rank at the all india level. He is also a cost accountant. He has an excellent academic record with ranks throughout the career. Sunil practices in the entire field of taxation with specialization in indirect taxes. He is one of the leading consultant for service tax and vat related matters. He is visiting faculty at Narsi Monju Institute of Management Studies, the Indo German Chamber of Commerce and the National Academy of Customs, Excise and Narcotics. He has authored books on topics relating to service tax, NRI taxation, and computers. His comprehensive treatise on service tax, published by Bharat Law House, runs in its 16th edition. He has delivered numerous talks on topics of professional interest at various forums, including industry and trade associations. He has also written articles in various professional and business journals. Uh, Sunil is a managing committee member of Bombay Chartered Accountants Society and a part of indirect taxation committee of the society. and a member of the study group 
constituted by Maharashtra government and the ICI for implementing GST. With this, on behalf of the behalf of Bombay Chatter Con Society and all of you, I welcome Sunil and would request Mukesh Trivedi to offer a memento as token of our respect and gratitude. I would hand over the proceedings to Sunil. Respected President Deepak Bhai, Past Presidents Govind Bhai, Sanjeev Bhai, Mukesh Bhai, Suhas, Seniors and Friends. A very good evening to all of you. When I was actually told to speak on the amnesty scheme, I was a bit skeptical. Because uh, looking at the scheme, I was wondering whether there's anybody who's really eligible. And if people are really not eligible, whether there would be a turnout. But uh, then you were jokingly saying that any incentive given to persons who evade the law always attracts people. More than that, I think this is a scheme which is likely to have far-reaching implications. As the Bhai said, it's one of its kind, perhaps the first. We had one amnesty scheme earlier, but that was not too structured a scheme. It was more done through a trade notice. And at that time, the reach of service tax was not as wide and killing as it is today. So we have a scheme which is fairly interesting. We'll have to see how it gets implemented. And that's, I think, the key to any legislation, including the amnesty scheme. Before we really go into the scheme, I think, uh, friends, let's look at a small prelude. And these are all examples which are live. Names and numbers may be different, but I'm sure each of us has faced these pains at some time or the other. We'll take a couple of examples and then try to understand what is the broad background. First case is a simplistic case. A person is a dealer, he buys and sells software. And software, whether it's goods or services, has been a never-ending uh, debate. This person felt that software is goods. He kept on collecting and paying VAT, didn't pay service tax. One fine day, he got a show cause notice saying that, look, software is a service, and you should have paid me service tax. And it has not been paid, so please pay the service tax along with interest and penalties. So that's one example which we are talking about. We are not going into the merits of the issue of whether software is a taxable service or not. But this is something which has happened and has happened in many, many examples like this. <coughs> Compare that person with another person who is a sort of a security agency. Every month, diligently collect service tax. Maybe the clients pay in time, don't pay in time. Due to the point of taxation rules is required to pay service tax by the 6th of the next month but is not in a position to pay the tax in time. Many a times there might be a huge delay, which perhaps the statutory auditor might have qualified in his audit report or in the CARO. That's another set of people. This person at some time might have received show cause notice, might not have received a show cause notice. Both the variations could be there. Then you have a third person who is a beauty parlor, preferred to stay unregistered. When a person walks in for a beauty treatment, collects the basic amount along with the service tax, pockets and merrily keeps the service tax with himself. The service tax department has no means to catch him or find that there is a beauty parlor of this nature. The broad thought process which we need to keep in mind is, are all these three similar? Can we treat each of them similarly? Or is there a need for some sympathy for the first person vis-a-vis -vis the other persons? That's friends, the background service tax as it has evolved has in its path of evolution created various situations wherein there have been either non-compliances or sometimes even perceived non-compliances. I am not sure whether A limited is really non-compliant. But there is a, as of now because of the show cause notice, there is really a perception of non-compliance. And there are many places wherein nobody can say with putting his head on the entire matter and say that yes, this is the only view. There are many, many situations. You have builders, you have renting, many places where really it's a matter of interpretation. And my interpretation can be as good as any other person's interpretation also. 
So can we really say that as the law has developed, each of these are cases of non-compliances and each of them should be treated at par. That's I think the big problem or the issue. And this is what even the government realized over the last couple of years. So you find that practically over the last two or three years, the government has tried to introduce provisions or amendment in the service tax regime. Meaning the government tries to differentiate between people who are actually culprits as so to say as compared to persons who have been victims of this entire process or victims of interpretation naturally i would say a limited is in the zone of a victim c limited would be a clearly a case of a culprit but when you're looking at b again there can be a somebody might say that no he is a victim of point of taxation rules somebody else might say no he is a culprit he, he was required to pay the tax and he should have paid the tax it's a shade of gray which we will have to think but yes, the broad thought process which I want to acclimatize to you is that there has to be some differentiation between a culprit and a victim. And this is what over the last two or three years, there have been various provisions in the law wherein the government has tried to differentiate between the two. They are saying that if you are a victim, if the transaction is a captured transaction, we will reduce penalties. So there is a rationalization in the provisions of the penalties. For captured transactions, lower penalty applies. For non-captured transaction, higher penalty applies. We are also told that if you collected the tax and not paid beyond six months, then we can prosecute you. And then there's a you know a staggering of the period of the prosecution. Lots of emphasis on recovery. So if you have not, uh, if there's a matter which is in dispute, either obtain a stay from the higher authorities, or there can be a bank attachment. So I think these are the this is a broad background wherein through legislative amendments and through policy initiatives, the government tried to uh, create a parity between the two, say that, okay, we want to act tough on the culprits, but act soft on the victims. Having said that, at the ground level, it was really very difficult to ensure that this objective is achieved. And that's where you find that you have various situations. And I was just wondering that why did you need a voluntary compliance scheme? Why doesn't a person who is really a victim, who wants to be honest, he was ignorant that tax is payable. Now he knows that the tax is actually payable. Why can't he just go and walk back, declare his taxes and pay? And that's where we find that when we actually advise clients, many a times clients come for a sur big surprise when they come to us for an opinion and they find that, okay, they were under an impression that tax is not payable. And after discussions, they get convinced that the tax is payable. But then taking the next step, deciding to actually pay the tax, there are lots of questions or problems which they face. I think the first problem is that it's a tax on gross basis. So the amount of tax itself is huge. On that tax, you have a high rate of interest. An unreasonable pay, a late filing fee every year, you have you know, every uh, return which is filed late, you have a fee which extends up to 20,000 rupees. And more important than that, the larger problem which most of the SSEs fear is that I go and pay the tax and interest voluntarily. The department is not going to look at me, at me very kindly. He is going to issue me a notice. They will allege suppression and demand notice. And then there will be a lot of harassment which will happen. So all of these are deterrents for a victim to actually come clean and uh, pay the taxes himself. As compared to that, if a person really does not have an intention to pay, for him there are two important incentives not to come clean. The first is the limitation period. In service tax, the matters cannot be reopened beyond a period of five years. In a way, five years is big, but for a person who really intends not to, ev not to pay tax, evade taxes, he will not supply information and he can play around with a little bit over here or there and ensure that he moves away from this period of five years. That is one aspect. And second aspect is, even if he is caught and a notice is issued, there is this provision which says that if you pay within 30 days of the order, then you have an option of paying 25% penalty. So there's always a upper cap of 25% penalty. So when you look at this entire scenario, you have situations wherein there are lots of deterrents to voluntary compliances. And that's where, as Deepak Bhai rightly pointed out, the government felt that there was a need 
to have a cleaning up of this entire system that's where we welcome the voluntary compliance encouragement scheme if you really look at the budget speech which even dipak bhai was highlighting in the start of the session the budget speech says something the scheme is totally different and this is what many a times happens in many other places also we have seen that the budget speech tries to justify the scheme by saying that there are 17 lakh assesses and only 7 lakh are filing returns so i want to clean up the mess i want to give the other 10 lakhs a chance to own up whatever has been done and provide them an amnesty from interest and penalties if you really read only this much one gets a feeling that if a person has just not filed the returns and he has complied with everything else he would be eligible for the scheme but when you go to the scheme that's not the truth the scheme starts by saying that a person should have tax dues to declare and we'll go into that and understand this concept well so that is where you see that there is a fundamental conflict in what has been stated in the speech vis-a-vis the actual act or the you know the scheme and the rules which are been mentioned there at so we are we cannot look at too much on that scheme and the speech as it has been said and come to a conclusion but when you really look at the broad contours of the scheme you will find that really the scheme is meant more towards the culprits rather than the victims and this is i think one of the biggest concerns which we had towards the scheme when it was announced it has debarred all cases where a show cause notice has been issued as we go into detail we'll uh, discuss the nuances of each of these aspects but the point is there's a show cause notice which is issued there's a dispute a person is disputing his tax liability and he wants to come forward and pay the taxes why should we not grant the benefit of the scheme to them that's a big question which exists but well this was represented to the finance minister as well but nothing has happened on it and therefore we have a scheme which is exactly the way it was announced on the budget day so yes of course that is one thing second aspect is when you read the scheme you will find that there are various places where not a lot of thought process has been gone about while drafting the scheme and that's where you will find the scheme offers various opportunities for the culprits to even become more larger culprits for example a normal assessee will be required to pay tax on a month on month basis but under the scheme a long time has been provided we are told that you have to pay the tax in two installments and the second installment can be paid as late as up to december 2014 this by itself presents a huge opportunity of a time arbitrage and this can really result in persons who are actually on the fence wanting to pay taxes in normal course not paying taxes and using this as a time arbitrage so that is again one aspect of this scheme that does it really create more with uh, culprits than what actually were one of its kind of scheme but yes there have been some similar amnesties in the past two of those amnesties pertain to pending disputes not in relation to a situation wherein there was an admitted tax due so 1998 we had a karvivad samadhan scheme in 2008 we had a service tax dispute resolution scheme both of these were for the pending disputes wherein you were required to pay some proportion of the taxes and based on that the balance amounts were waived 2004 we had something known as an extraordinary tax payer friendly scheme wherein we were required to pay the tax along with interest no penalties to be paid but all the other proceedings continued as they were now we have 2013 and this is the scheme which we'll be concentrating on in more detail the voluntary compliance encouragement scheme which basically is a very simple scheme if you look at it to its nuts and bolts it says calculate your pending tax dues and there's a definition of tax dues which says that it's the window from october 2007 to december 2012 calculate your pending tax dues pay that tax dues in the installment schedules as mentioned so long as you pay those tax dues you will not pay any interest you will not pay any penalties and we will not proceed against you so we are told all pending tax dues to be paid 
total immunity from interest total immunity from penalties and immunity from other proceedings so in that sense looks a very interesting scheme especially in cases where persons have collected and not paid taxes it's really a lifetime opportunity which a person gets i'm sure you will not get similar schemes in future and the enforcement mechanism post the scheme would definitely improve drastically and therefore it's one opportunity which one should not miss so what's the macro picture as i told you we have to pay the service tax on or before the due dates what are those due dates we are told calculate your tax dues minimum 50% should be paid before december 2013 that is the first installment balance 50% can be paid by june 2014 if you pay before june 2014 no interest is to be paid you are given a time of up to december 2014 if you pay by that time you will pay an interest which is the normal 18% interest from the 1st of july 2014 so for any period after the june 2014 you will end up paying interest on that so it's in a way it's a very lucrative scheme of payment of service tax one important catch which has come in through the vces rules which have been notified recently we are told that this tax has to be paid in cash it cannot be paid through utilization of sendmed credit so if you already have a situation of lots of input services and service tax on that if you are going under the normal scheme you will have paid the net amount and paid interest on that net amount as compared to that under this scheme you will have to pay the gross amount friends make no mistake the scheme doesn't say that you will not avail credit it says you will not utilize the credit for payment of tax under this scheme which means that the sendmed credit which was available during this period can be availed and can be utilized against the future service tax liability it's only that it cannot be adjusted during this period within which the scheme is given to you so in that sense this rule which says that you cannot utilize sendwet credit is more like a cash flow issue it's like you will be adjusting it against your future service tax liabilities it's not really a cost to you as i told you no interest no penalties and no proceedings under the act so in that sense overall a very interesting and a good scheme which i have tried to propose let's quickly look at the normal provisions visa visa is the vcs scheme and then we'll go into the issues one by one as i was highlighting the service tax amount under the normal scheme you will pay it after adjustment of sendwet credit but under vcs you will pay it before adjustment of sendwet credit sendwet credit can be claimed later one important catch if you are going under the amnesty scheme there is no possibility of refund of the amounts paid under the amnesty scheme this may be very important in situations wherein the matter is under dispute for example builders renting many builders many landlords are paying service tax but both these matters are pending before the supreme court we more or less know that okay even if the judgment comes favorable getting a refund is a herculean task but under the normal mechanism there is at least a possibility of you getting the refund or the consumer getting the refund under the amnesty scheme under the vcs scheme if you are going to pay the tax there is no possibility of refund either to you or to the buyer or the consumer nobody will get any refund whatsoever so this is one important thing which we should bear in mind interest of course no not payable penalty is not payable late filing fees there is a clarification which says that no late filing fees are payable if you go under the amnesty scheme friends make no mistake the late filing fee is not payable only if you are eligible to go under the scheme and you are under the scheme if there were no tax dues or for whatever reasons you are not eligible to go under the scheme then necessarily the right hand column does not apply to you at all there is an immunity from prosecution and even recovery proceedings at least up to the period during which the scheme is in operation so in that sense an overall comparison you find let the vcs really is something which one will have to look forward to and enjoy the scheme to the best possible extent how do you go about it what are the process steps the government says if you are not registered first obtain a registration and this answers one of the questions which we frequently face that if i am already registered am i eligible for the scheme the answer is yes you are eligible for the scheme the scheme does not differentiate between registered ssc and unregistered ssc both of them are eligible for unregistered ssc there is an additional process step which says that you will obtain a registration before you enter into the scheme 
So that is fine. You can apply for uh, registration in ST1 and obtain the registration and then move into the next step of the scheme. And if you are already registered, this step is not applicable to you. You are required to make an application declaring your tax dues in form VCES1. So there's a simplistic form which has been given wherein you'll calculate your tax dues. We'll go into how to calculate those tax dues and you'll make this application before the designated officer. We are told the designated officers for service tax division one and two, both are defined to be sitting over here in church gate office itself. So you can go to him and make an application in form VCES1. Once an application is made in form VCES1, within a week's time, the designated officer is expected to give you an acknowledgement of the application made. So he'll give you an acknowledgement in form VCES2, wherein he will define the schedules that, okay, this much is the tax dues which you have declared, 50% payable now, 50% payable without interest up to this day, or payable with interest after that day. So it's a provisional form. It does not say that you paid the taxes and you are eligible for the immunity. It just says that, okay, this is the, I received this form and you have to pay in these much times. Based on the schedule, you keep on making the payment along with interest or without interest, depending on when you decide to pay the tax dues. After you make the entire tax payments, go back to the designated officer and inform him about your tax payments. Once you inform him about the tax payments, he will issue you a final acknowledgement of discharge of tax dues, which he will give you in form VCES3. This he is required to give you within a week from the date you intimate to him your entire tax payment schedule. Now this is the general scheme. So once you get the acknowledgement of discharge, the scheme concludes for you at that. The immunity is granted to you. There are two dampeners here. One is if your uh, declaration is substantially false, the commissioner can issue you a show cause notice within a period of one year. We'll go into the mechanics of this a few minutes later. And if you are not eligible, then the designated officer can reject your declaration. So these are the two important uh, stumbling blocks which you should be very, very careful about when you are going into the scheme. So this is the broad process steps. When you look at it, what are the key areas to be discussed? I think the entire scheme can be discussed into three broad areas and in each of them there are multiple issues which I've tried to identify and we'll try to address them in each of the compartments. Firstly, and at the outset, it is very important for every one of us to understand who is eligible and who is not eligible. A mistake made in applying in a case where there was no eligibility can be very costly. So one has to be asking yourself at least three or four times a question that am I really eligible? So we'll spend reasonable time understanding this concept of eligibility for the scheme. Having said that, yes, I am eligible, how do I calculate the tax dues on which I am eligible for the amnesty? So that's the second thing. There's a definition given for tax dues and we'll look at various scenarios and understand whether a particular aspect is eligible for the amnesty scheme in terms of the tax dues and how to calculate your tax dues. And then, of course, the process steps which we have told, if you are eligible and there are tax dues, you will go into the scheme. The process steps, uh, steps which we discussed will be followed. And then what is the extent of immunity which you get if you are eligible for the scheme and you comply with the processes or the procedures mentioned in the scheme. So I think these are the three broad bucket, uh, baskets which we'll be talking about as we move forward. The first one on eligibility. And I think this is the most important part to discuss. Section 1061 of the Finance Act 2013, which is where the scheme is located, Chapter 5 of the Finance Act 2013. Reads, it's a simple English. It says, any person may declare his tax dues, and there's a definition for tax dues, which we have a separate compartment to talk about, in respect of which no notice or an order has been issued before 1st of March 2013. This gives you the first person who is not allowed. Any person on whom a show cause notice has been issued before 1st March 2013, then for the issue related to the show cause notice, you cannot apply for the amnesty scheme. You are out of the scheme. <coughs> then we are told, provided that any person who has furnished return and disclosed the amount of service tax but not paid it, shall not be covered by the scheme. Meaning, if you have filed a return, and this is again one very important problem of the scheme. We are seeing more and more situations where 
the government says okay i want to give you the support i want to give you the benefit of the scheme only in situations where either you are too smart to stay away from me or my people are so dumb that they have not been able to catch you so if you have been honest enough you really had cash flow issues but you were honest enough you said the due date for return is going i want to file the return i want to be compliant with the law to the extent possible i filed the return i said the service tax payable so much paid only this much balance to be paid i have accepted my liability the scheme says if you have already accepted your liability in the returns pay a price for your honesty the scheme is not eligible for you so this is one important concern and this concern you will find exists in many many places so as of now we are saying tax dues which are disclosed in the returns not eligible for the scheme we are further told that if a show cause notice has been issued for one period then for tax dues for a similar period in a future period will also not be eligible to be disclosed under the scheme because again the government knows you government knows the issue so they can issue you a follow up show cause notice any date the whole idea of the scheme is to catch people who are really away from the department whom the department is not able to catch so in that sense these are the two important ineligibilities which we can see from the basic declaration section which is section 106 subsection 1 let's look at some issues and we have three or four questions or practical problems which might come up let's take up a case of a person who has been issued a show cause notice is a trader he receives discount from his manufacturer and he has been issued a show cause notice wherein it is told that no according to us this is not discount you are promoting the product of your manufacturer so please pay me a service tax under the category of business auxiliary service he is fighting on this issue in the various forums so this is naturally not a subject matter of the vcs scheme amnesty scheme is not eligible on this however the same person has also received certain repairs charges or maintenance charges and there has been no show cause notice on this point so the question is whether he can apply for the amnesty scheme whether he can go under the vcs scheme the answer to this the cbc has through a circular clarified it has said that if there is no show cause notice on the issue then you can apply for this scheme this person is debarred for applying for that issue of discount versus commission but for the maintenance charges there is no show cause notice therefore he can file a declaration for the issue which has been raised no show you cannot apply for the other issues you can and this is where i think we will have to now go into the second layer which is how to interpret this phrase same issue now i am taking a small variation to this first example very simple we had a show cause notice on business auxiliary service and this person wants to declare service tax under maintenance or repair services very simple no problems second situation is a little bit complicated this person also received certain commission which was actually commission on which he has not paid service tax and on this also he has not received a show cause notice the question is whether he can disclose under the scheme for this commission now this will depend on how do you interpret this phrase same issue will you look at same issue vis a vis a category will you look at same issue vis a vis the nature of the income or will you look at same issue vis a vis the specific transactions which have been the subject matter of the show cause notice according to me one will have to look at vis a vis the specific transactions governing that aspect so in this case the show cause notice was on characterization of discount as commission it was not on a situation where the transaction is actually commission and you didn't pay the service tax so according to me even here the issue is not the same and you can apply for the vcs scheme for the second aspect as well now third aspect is another situation where really there's no issue but you know today we have so cause notices even on non issues so this is a person of a habitual defaulter who kept on paying late payments of service taxes and filed uh, returns late in general so in the past he has been issued a show cause notice for the period of 2002 to 2007 there's no issue admittedly the activity is taxable the person is paying the tax but he has paid late tax or not paid some tax so there has been a show cause notice on that 
now from 2008 to 2013 there are further delays now 2002 to 2007 matter is independent whether this person can apply for the amnesty scheme this is a big question and uh, you know whether you will say that what is the issue involved in this the issue is there is a delayed payment of tax and that issue is the same earlier also it was issue of delayed payment of tax even today you are having an issue of delayed payment of tax so it may become a same issue because there is really no other disjoint issue available and this is where one has to be a little bit careful because earlier there have been situations where n block notices have been issued today that doesn't happen today you get letters but earlier there have been situations where in n block notices have been issued for delayed filing of returns even if you have filed returns in time you got notices like that now please note once a show cause notice is issued you are debarred on that issue whether that show cause notice is ultimately in your favor or not that is not the concern even if the outcome of the show cause notice is in your favor or is likely to be in your favor yet you cannot go under the scheme so that is one which has to be very careful about that's the uh, delayed returns uh, thing which we are trying to bring out another important question which keeps on coming up is a company has three branches branch number a let's say bombay branch has received a show cause notice there is a separate registration for bombay and a separate registration for ahmedabad branch on the same value on the same transaction the ahmedabad branch has not received a show cause notice so whether the ahmedabad branch which is another service tax registration number a separate file as far as the service tax department is concerned can say that look i have not received a show cause notice at all so i will apply for the amnesty scheme i will go under the vcs this is one question which is very frequently being asked now here according to me the scheme talks about a person there for administrative conveniences you might have a centralized registration or a decentralized registration but this is all at the ground level of how you are implementing this law the person liable to pay tax is the particular company not the mumbai branch of the company or the ahmedabad branch of the company so even if the mumbai branch which is separately registered has received a show cause notice in my view the ahmedabad branch on the same issue cannot apply for the vcs it is debarred from the scheme what if the show cause is issued after the 1st of march you have various situations you know where show cause is might have been issued in april or so naturally you can apply in the scheme but please note that in this case you have to also see section 106 subsection 2 which basically talks about a situation where if there is any investigation which is pending as on the 1st of march then you are not eligible so you have to be careful that there is no investigation pending against you so that is section 106 subsection 1 which talks about non eligibility in case of show cause notice eligibility in case there are tax dues and there is no show cause notice or the tax dues are not disclosed in the returns that i think summarizes the provisions of section 106 subsection 1 we then go to the second subsection 106 subsection 2 which says who all is not eligible so 1061 says you are, these are the persons who are eligible which also has negative conditions and then you have 1062 which says in this cases you are not eligible at all so this also is an important provision which you need to bear in mind and this is where you will find that quite a lot of assesses will be within 1062 and moving out of the eligibility for the scheme what does 1062 say it says where a declaration has been made by a person against whom an inquiry or investigation in respect of service tax not levied etc has been initiated by way of a search by way of issuance of summons or by way of issuance of a letter requiring production of accounts etc so if you have been issued a summons under section 14 some statement has been recorded and the matter is pending or you have been issued a letter asking for certain information like our balance sheet or your sales register or details of invoices or send wet credit invoices various types of informations they can keep on asking you under rule 5a of the service tax rules or 
if an audit has been initiated, audit meaning an excise audit, EA 2000 audit, an intimation has been issued to you and that inquiry, investigation, audit, etc. has not concluded. If it has concluded, you are eligible for the scheme. If it has not concluded and it is pending as on the 1st of March 2013, then we are told the officer shall reject the declaration. It's a mandatory thing, it's not may. I would have preferred if it was a may, but it's we are told he shall reject the declaration. So this is an important thing. You might just file a declaration because it's a self-declaration, you may just go and file. And later on the designated officer might do his own back-end inquiries or investigations and he may find out that no, there was some aspect or some inquiry which was pending. And if there was any inquiry which was pending, then he will reject your declaration. Moment he rejects your declaration, you are not eligible for any, any immunity under this scheme. You have admitted your tax dues, so there is very little defense which you are left with. So one has to be very, very careful about section 106 subsection 2. Many a times we have seen that there is a frequent turnover of staff in an organization. The company might at some point of time have just received an audit intimation. The person might have been busy, he might have asked for some time for submission of information. And then everybody in the organization might have just forgotten or lost track of this set of communications. Even the department might have forgotten, even you might have forgotten. And now, in good belief, you might apply in the VCES. When the matter is cross-checked with the audit section of the department, they find out that no, this person, EA audit has already been initiated, but the FAR is not done. Final audit report is not signed you are in a big problem. So one has to be very, very careful to ensure that there is no such situation where there has been an investigation or something and which is pending, audit, investigation, any of these aspects which we are talking about over here. One more aspect which I would like to bring out over here is, as compared to the show cause notice, wherein the eligibility or ineligibility was based on an issue, when you go to this section, the eligibility or ineligibility is not based on the issue. If you are aware that a person has issued you a summons in relation to a particular type of a transaction only, yet you can't say that no, for this issue I will not go under the amnesty, for other issues I will go under the amnesty. Moment a summons has been issued, there is a blanket denial. You are out of the scheme altogether. And this is again one important thing which we should bear in mind. Same questions which keep on coming up. What if an EA audit notice is issued for one premises and dues are pending for another premises? I think I have already answered this. We will have to look at it person specific and not registration specific. And therefore you will not be eligible for the scheme. Second is what if a manufacturer is issued an intimation for audit under the Excise Act? Now this is where one can uh, try to interpret the provisions. What we are told is an audit has been initiated and naturally we are talking about the service tax provisions. So you have a situation that a manufacturer has been issued an EA 2000 audit under the provisions of the Excise Act. So he is going to you know, verify the factory related records. Now necessarily in the EA audit, even in a manufacturer's audit, Excise people look at the service tax records. If that is pending, one can still say that no, there is no audit pending under the service tax regime and therefore I would be eligible under the service tax regime. So that position can be taken, not totally free of doubt, but I would feel that it would still be a correct way of looking at it. What if a third party is issued, and this is very common. Today you have situations like a manufacturer will be issued a summons, and on oath, the department will take information of all the job workers engaged by him, or contractors engaged by him, names, addresses, and the amounts paid, and then they will continue and directly issue so cause notices, or they send, it to, uh, send the information to the respective wards. Now the job worker or the contractor has not been issued any summons or no investigation has been started against him. But investigation is started against the manufacturer to obtain information only. According to me, here since no summons has been issued on that person, the person would be eligible. It's a third party. Third party summons, I don't have any preview of information and I cannot be debarred based on the summons which has been issued on a third party. 
Next interesting question which comes up, and this is a live example which we faced. What if an audit intimation is issued on the 1st of March and also served on the 1st of March? Now this is where if you go to this scheme, we are told that if a notice has been issued and such inquiry, investigation or audit is pending as on the 1st of March. So uh, once the notice is served on you, the letter is served on you, the investigation is pending. So even if you receive an audit intimation on the 1st of March, you are ineligible for the scheme. Now compare that with the show cause notice provisions where under the show cause notice provisions we are told before the 1st of March. So if a show cause is issued on the 1st of March, that does not debar you. But if an audit intimation is issued dated 1st of March, you are really unlucky, you will not be in a position to enter into the scheme because of this difference in the wordings between those two provisions. Oh, I am sure all of us are aware of the basic difference between a show cause and investigations pre-show cause. So I am not spending too much time explaining the concept of audit intimations, letters and a show cause come demand notice. So that is the question which comes up. And a larger problem which comes from this provision is many a times we have seen in practical parlance that the department just keeps on calling for information or issues a summons and records a statement and they generally sleep over that matter. And it is an elongated matter, maybe sometimes for six months, one year also, there is no action from the department, further action at all. Now in this type of a situation, the question which comes up is, how do I know whether the matter is pending or not pending? Because my ineligibility is only if there is a matter which is pending as on the 1st of March 2013. Now for an audit, if it is an excise audit, as we know, excise audit concludes through an issuance of a draft audit report and then a final audit report. Moment the final audit report has been issued, you can very easily say that look, my investigation has concluded, my audit has concluded and there is no matter which is pending. So there is a defined process as far as the excise audit is concerned. But for other matters, if it is a summons or it is a letter inquiring or requesting for information under rule 5A. There may not, you may not really be a preview because the department never issues you a letter saying that look, I had started the inquiry under the summons mode and this is the conclusion of the inquiry. I have never seen such a letter till date. This is where I think one will have to be a bit careful. One will have to go to the respective uh, jurisdiction or the person issuing the letter and check his records whether there are any file notings which say that the file has been closed. Now one has to be a bit careful because when you are doing that, you are trying to throw hints and a file which is ideally either closed or lying in a cold storage might attract attention. So one has to be a little bit careful about this identification of whether there is any inquiry which is pending. But without knowing this, applying also can be very risky because as we know that if you apply and later on this aspect is coming out then the entire declaration will get rejected, you will be totally toothless and you will be facing huge penalties and other consequences under the normal provisions of the act. And that is where I think a question which comes up is, is there any time limit whereby the designated officer can define that okay this is the time within which I will reject the declaration. If you look at the VCS rules, there have been timelines for issuance of VCS1, uh, VCS2 and VCS3. They have said within 7 working days, the designated officer will issue you an acknowledgement of discharge or an acknowledgement of application being filed. The provisions talk about issuance of a show cause notice in case of a substantially false declaration within a period of 1 year. But there is nothing under the sections or under the scheme which defines a timeline for rejection of the declaration and this is a little bit scary because at any point of time the designated officer can come back and say that look you had filed a declaration in that declaration you have self declared that there is no investigation pending and now I find out from my sources and he will have to justify it through reasons that yes these are the reasons why there was an investigation or something pending as on the 1st of March and because that is pending against you I will not allow you, now already you have applied, you have got the declarations, everything is done, but I will reject your declaration. Now this is where I think there is a little bit of ambiguity which is pending 
there's a section of immunity when we go into that we'll discuss that in detail also whether the final acknowledgement of discharge of tax dues whether after that the person can reject the declaration i think there is no answer for this question as of now and we will have to see how it gets implemented because the way the immunity has been granted you will find that really the department has very little scope for investigating things and if that be the case maybe somebody might just say that no there has to be some mechanism whereby there is a there has to be a fallback and perhaps this rejection of declaration can be one of the fallbacks which the department might be looking at so one has to be a little bit careful on that so just to summarize this first aspect or the major part of the discussion which was regarding eligibility under the scheme there has to be tax dues and the next few moments we'll be talking in detail about the tax dues we are told that the tax dues should be pending as on the 1st of march and they should be for a period from october 2007 all the way up to december 2012 any dues beyond december 2012 is not eligible tax dues is defined we'll go into that we are then told section 106 of section 1 talks about issue driven ineligibility where show cause notice is issued or order has been issued or where the tax is disclosed in the returns and then you have blanket ineligibility based on the person in cases where there is some investigation etc which is pending so this i think summarizes the first basket of discussion which relates to ineligibility or eligibility of persons who can go under the scheme very frankly if you look at it if you are already registered it's very likely that more than 50 or 60% of those cases will become ineligible either because they are regularly paying taxes or because some investigation is pending or because some show cause notice is pending so those who are registered one will have to be careful about all of these aspects before we jump into the next step which is the tax dues let's now go to tax dues the first important thing is that section 106 says that there should be some pending tax dues any person who has tax dues to declare can declare if i have no tax dues to declare there's no question of going in the scheme and that's where the frequently asked question that i have paid my taxes diligently but i have not filed my returns whether i am eligible for the scheme i think our answer is very clear to all of us if there are no tax dues to declare you are not eligible for the scheme but then you know uh, this is one question which keeps on coming up in many forums that if a person is asked a question what is 2 plus 2 a general person will say answer is 4 but if he is an advocate he'll ask a question what do you want to make it to be if there are no tax dues i'm sure one can find some tax dues something under reverse charge mechanism something which is unpaid interpretation of point of taxation interpretation of valuation i'm sure even a most honest tax payer can find something where based on interpretation he can take a position that this is pending moment there is some tax due and there is no definition of a minimum benchmark of tax dues so once there are some tax dues you are eligible for the scheme what is tax dues defined to be we are told tax dues means service tax due or payable under the chapter now the chapter basically means chapter 5 of the uh, finance act 1994 which is the service tax law or any other amount due or payable under section 73a which is amount collected in the name of tax excess collection of tax for the period from october 7 to december 12 including a cess levyable under the act but not paid as on the first day of march 2013 simple enough from this simple proposition we have various variations and uh, we can examine whether in each of these situations you are eligible for declaration whether you should go in and declare these as tax dues first is simple tax collected but not paid clearly it's a tax payable under section 73 if it pertains to this period which we have defined then naturally you can go for this scheme there's no question subject to the eligibility criteria tax not collected but undisputed this again naturally is eligible for the scheme and because it is undisputed it may make sense to pay only thing is you, whether you are able to collect it from the customers or whether this tax is going from your own pockets first case this issue was not there because you had collected it but that's some uh, call which the businessman will have to take whether he wants to bleed from his pockets and pay it or whether he wants to play his chances on this aspect 
tax not collected but disputed this is one area where you need to think twice before you go in the scheme if there is really a dispute whether you should go in this scheme understand that once there is a dispute something which is a litigation prone matter it's very likely that the department will not be able to substantiate the extended period of limitation because as you know a show cause notice has to be issued within the period of limitation defined under section 73 the general period of limitation is 18 months so the department can go back only 18 months to collect a tax from you however if there is a suppression fraud or an intention to evade tax they can go back to 5 years now if you have a situation where tax is not collected and it's a disputed matter and there's a serious dispute on that issue in that case it will be very difficult for the department to go back to 5 years having said that therefore it means that if you go under amnesty amnesty you have to pay for that entire 5 and a half year block under the normal provisions you might still continue that dispute and if you have still not received a show cause if you have received a show cause then you are never you are not going to discuss this at all whenever you receive a show cause it will be for the 18 month window only which will be much smaller than the 5 year tax which you are paying right now second aspect is in a way by applying for the amnesty it might imply an indirect admission of your tax liability so whether one wants to do that one has to be a little bit careful as far as this third basket of items which is talks about taxes which are not collected but are disputed tax payable under the composition or presumptive options necessarily this is also a tax payable under the chapter and you should be eligible for the scheme i don't see any concerns on that tax or income which is not disclosed in accounts now necessarily there's an amnesty you can go under this scheme but you'll have to consider impact under the other legislations because the immunity is provided only under the service tax legislation it's not provided under other legislations you'll have to consider your audit uh, processes whether there will be a need to qualify whether that person will have to you know auditor will have to put some remarks on this how it will go in the income tax proceedings all that you might need to take a call before you decide to go under vcs for this item of tax which is collected but not disclosed in the accounts tax payable under reverse charge mechanism and this is you know in june july 2012 when we brought the negative list based taxation of services there's a partial reverse charge mechanism which has been brought in and we have seen many persons who have not been able to comply with it either fully or even partially now i think this is a good opportunity for them to clear up to identify such weaknesses identify such open areas and go under the scheme many a times it may not really be a cost also because the tax which you pay under the reverse charge mechanism if you are a service provider or a manufacturer you might be eligible for a credit as well this is where one of the questions which keeps on coming up that if i have paid tax under the vces whether that tax is available as a credit and the question which comes up is because rule 9 of the senvet credit rules debars credit in case the credit is claimed on a supplementary invoice based on suppression fraud etc etc so a question which is being asked is does my going into the vces indirectly mean that there was suppression and therefore the credit will not be allowed for the amounts which are paid under the vces my answer to this is we cannot look at it like this especially for the reverse charge mechanism two issues firstly just because i'm going under a vces does not mean that i am admitting to a suppression suppression is a word which is so strong that it necessarily has to be proved it cannot be presumed and secondly even if you presume suppression for the reverse charge mechanism it does not work because my duty paying document is the chalan of service tax payment in reverse charge mechanism i claim the credit based on a chalan which is another sub clause in rule 9 and supplementary invoice works only in a situation where the service provider is paying the tax and collecting it from the service recipient so for both those reasons for lapses on account of reverse charge mechanism i think this is a god sent opportunity if possible one should examine and look at the amnesty scheme in this area next question is wrong availment of senvet credit you have claimed credit of outdoor catering over the last two years outdoor catering is a part of negative list of senvet credit input service definition now as a long list of items on which you can't claim the credit 
you never knew it so even though the law changed in april 11 you kept on claiming the credit can you go under the amnesty scheme the answer to this is in the negative because any tax which has been wrongly claimed as credit has to be reversed and the amount is payable under the Senved credit rules. That amount is not payable under the Finance Act 1994. So any lapses in the Senved credit provisions and any payments on that account are amounts which will not be eligible. They will not be defined as tax dues and therefore you will not be eligible for any of this. Same thing wrong utilization. You have situations of you know various brokers who were claiming uh, credit fully and then there's this issue that you are also treated as a trader of securities so there has to be a proportionate reversal and then the department says that you reverse proportionately the credit now all these types of situations wherein there are amounts payable under the servet credit rules all of them would not be eligible for the benefit next is irregular adjustment of service tax rule 63 of the service tax rules permits self adjustment of service tax in some cases you have adjusted the tax and now you realize no no you wrongly adjusted it whether you can claim the credit, the benefit of the scheme. This would form as tax dues, there's no two doubts on it. But the problem is the earlier section, section 1061, which says that if the amount is disclosed in the return, then you cannot apply for the scheme. Necessarily, rule 63 adjustment would have been disclosed in the return. And because of that, you will not be eligible. Not because it is not tax dues, but because it becomes a part of section 106, subsection 1, provision to that. The next question which comes up is, we are told you will disclose the tax dues for a period and your immunity and everything else is provided vis-a-vis -vis the period. So the question which comes up is what is this period? Is it October 7th up to December 12th is one period in itself and whatever you do is throughout this period or will you look at period vis-a-vis -vis the specific return filing periods? Interestingly, if you look at the entire scheme, there is no answer to this and the entire benefits provided under the scheme, eligibility and immunity is all based on period. Interestingly, the declarations, the forms, VCS 1, 2, 3, none of them talk about the period. And this is a very important issue which comes out. Why is it so important? Let us say a person has no outstanding taxes from October 7 all the way to, let's say, 10. And then 10, 11, there are some outstanding tax dues. So he is eligible for the scheme. He has not filed a single return. Will he get relief from the penalties of non-filing return for the entire five-year block? Or will he get the benefit only for the one year during which he had a pending tax due? That is a question which basically comes out over here. According to me, one will have to look at the entire period as a single block. It will have to be from October 7 to December 12 as a single block. It has ramifications both ways. If you are in a cash flow issue and you want to selectively disclose, which is again lethal, that also will not be available. You will have to make a true and complete disclosure for October 7 to December 12. It would be, according to me, a single block period which will have to be looked at. The second question which immediately comes up is, if you look at the period from October 7 to March 8, even five years, which is the extended period of limitation is over. So typically the department could never issue you a SOCOS notice today for a period from seven, for the period of seven, eight. So should I really disclose, am I required to pay tax under this scheme for seven, eight? According to me, the answer is that tax is payable. Limitation only means that it is not recoverable by the other side. It doesn't mean that it is not payable by you. So if the scheme says, that you have to disclose from October 7 to March 8 also and it makes it as one of the conditions of the scheme. Necessarily, if you want to be eligible for the scheme, you will have to disclose it and pay that tax also. I would feel that one should not take chances, especially it's a six month period. There might be a problem of rejection of the declaration or treating it as a substantially false declaration and that can create some problems at a later stage. So better to disclose this period also and pay it knowing very well that yes, it is something which in normal course wouldn't have been recoverable at all, even if suppression is alleged. This Senved credit issue we already talked about. Partial tax dues cannot be declared. The scheme is very clear. You have to make a true and complete disclosure of your taxes. And then there is a provision which says that if there is a substantially false declaration, then a show cause notice can be issued. 
What if the tax dues are found to be incorrect later? They'll issue you a show cause notice and they expect you to pay the balance tax dues. How do you calculate this tax dues? I think the process is knowing the entire service tax law and the mechanism of calculation of tax dues does not change vis-a-vis -vis the VCS as compared to the normal service tax regime. So first thing is what you need to do is from your accounts and your transactions identify what comprehensively all the services. Remember that for a substantial period of time we had a selective basis taxation so you will have to identify the taxable services under which they would fall categories of taxable services. Identify the point of taxation again may be important because if the point of taxation is spilling beyond December 2012 you will not be eligible for the scheme. Identify the situs of the service whether it was in India whether export benefits import uh, obligations all of them you can identify. Claim exemptions importantly including the small scale exemption if eligible. So if you have a situation of a borderline case one year you had 12 lakhs one year you had 10 lakhs you can examine claim the exemption and then go for this scheme. It's only on the balance amount just because you're going in the scheme doesn't mean that the small scale exemption will be not available to you. Of course the scheme talk, we have to be clear that the scheme talks about eligibility based on the previous year's turnover. Claim abatements as eligible to you. Apply valuation rules if required free issue materials etc including come tax working because most of these cases if you have not collected the taxes you can do a reverse working and calculate your balance tax dues. Reduce the tax which has already been paid or already declared in the returns but not paid because that you will have to pay in the normal course. Balance becomes your tax dues for the period. Now this as per the VCS rules we are told we will have to calculate it service wise total all the tax dues for each of the services total that up put it in the main form and put an annexure wherein which is in the format of rule th uh, column 3f of your return and submit it with the authorities this is what is the broad scheme this is what becomes the calculation of your tax dues so long so good only thing is each of these process steps has its own interpretation issue so today in good faith you will follow each of these rectangles which are mentioned here calculate the tax dues to be let us say an odd number of 21 lakhs 20,000. Immediate question which comes up is tomorrow can somebody question this number 2120 or can somebody question that one of these rectangles you have not correctly done. One of these answers to one of these questions was not correctly done. That's I think the key part in this entire scheme. Understanding the scope of the department to question what you have done. Whether they can tomorrow come back and say no, I will not give you come tax benefit for whatever reasons best known to them. Can they come back and tell you no, notification one was not available to you because you didn't satisfy one of the conditions mentioned therein? Can these questions be asked? That's an important aspect which we need to examine and that's where we need to understand what exactly is the immunity granted to you. When I'm talking about immunity, this is a forum, I know it's a lecture meeting but I am aware that most of us here are professionals and I would not like to shy away from some answers. Some of the answers may be just, some of them may not be fair. But if you look at the legal interpretations, they may be the correct answers. So one will have to use discretion, one will have to use caution. I will be giving my views, but end of the day, it's a position which each of you will have to take and see whether one wants to look at the scope of immunity to the extent that we are proposing to discuss today. What's the immunity granted to you? Section 108. This is the section which grants you the immunity. If you have declared the tax dues, you have paid the tax dues, you got an acknowledgement of discharge, then go to section 108. What does 108 say? Notwithstanding anything contained in any other provisions, the declarant upon payment of tax dues shall get immunity from penalty, interest or any other proceedings under the chapter. The chapter is the finance act. Subsection 2. Subject to the provisions of section 111 which is false declaration, we will come to that. A declaration shall become conclusive upon issuance of acknowledgement of discharge and no matter shall be reopened thereafter in any proceedings under the chapter before any authority or court relating and this is important relating
to the period covered by such declaration. And as I highlighted to you, according to me, the period covered by the declaration will have to be interpreted to be a uniform period from October 2007 up to December 2012. Now this is just two sentences or two paragraphs which governs the entire scope of immunity. I tried to look at the earlier schemes. And if you look at the earlier schemes, there is a fundamental difference in the way the earlier schemes were drafted and this scheme is drafted. Both the earlier schemes which are documented, extraordinary taxpayer friendly scheme was never documented. It was through a trade notice, so we can't compare. But the uh, Karvivad Samadhan scheme and the service tax dispute resolution scheme, both of them said that no matter covered by such order, meaning the scope of that declaration and that order, shall be reopened. As compared to that, here we are not saying no matter covered by the declaration. Covered by the declaration is very conspicuously absent. We are told no matter relating to the period covered by the declaration. This gives a lot of latitude, a lot of additional benefit, perhaps unintended. The idea clearly was not to give an immunity against an item which is not declared in the scheme. But the way it is drafted, it appears that for that period, it's a honeymoon period. Moment you are under the scheme, you are in an absolute honeymoon. They just can't ask you any questions because it's a period, no matter for the period covered by the declaration. Whether it's covered in the tax dues amount, whether it is not covered, all of that is irrelevant. Moment you have made a declaration, you are out of the entire normal provisions up to December 2000. Now, necessarily it can't be so good and that's where we kept on talking about something known as substantially false declaration. We have section 111 which is a safeguard which the government has which says that if the commissioner has reasons to believe that the declaration which you have made was substantially false, then he can serve you a notice and he can say that okay, you have declared 20 lakhs 21,000 but according to me you should have paid 50 lakhs 21,000. So balance 30 lakhs tax dues you have not paid please show cause why you should not pay the balance 30 lakhs. Now you can have your own version. You can say that no, this is an interpretation issue. I was never required to pay 30 lakhs. For that 30 lakhs, which is the differential tax dues, you can go under the normal mechanism and the show cause notice, you will file a reply to the show cause notice, there will be a hearing and the normal appellate mechanism will also flow for as far as that differential tax dues is concerned. Now if you look at this section, again, it says the notice will only demand differential tax dues. It doesn't say that the show cause notice can demand interest and penalties on the differential tax dues. So it's like for the differential tax dues also you will get the same immunity if you agree. If you don't agree, you have your version to answer. You can answer that question and ultimately it's the judiciary who will decide whether your version is correct or the department's version is correct. But if you agree, you can pay that differential tax dues and that would be the other story. There would not be any interest or penalties even on this aspect. So the impact of section 111, it can be triggered only in cases of substantially false declaration. Now what is meant by substantially false itself can be a subject matter of interpretation. Whether if I declare 20 lakhs and somehow for a clerical error, if 10, 15,000 is left out, whether it can be said to be substantially false. I have my doubts whether it can be said to be substantially false. <laughs> Whether an issue of interpretation, I am a works contractor, I have paid composition service tax, I have not added the free issue material because there is a dispute which is pending in the courts. Can the commissioner later on say that because you have not added the free issue material value, your declaration is substantially false? According to me, no, because it is a matter of interpretation, it does not render the declaration substantially false. The problem in the entire scheme is there is no mechanism or there is no the scheme or the forms are so simplistic. There is no there is no detail required, there is no detailed reconciliation required, there is no communication of the tax positions taken by you to be mentioned in that forms. In the absence of all of this, and especially in an evolving law where there are so many issues, you might have taken a position. And the department might take another position. And whether this can be said to be a substantially false declaration. According to me, no, it cannot be said to be a substantially false declaration. Another important checkpoint is that this show cause notice has to be issued 
विद इन अ पीरियड ऑफ वन ईयर फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ डिक्लेरेशन मेक नो मिस्टेक इट इज द डेट ऑफ डिक्लेरेशन नॉट द डेट ऑफ एक्नोलेजमेंट ऑफ डिस्चार्ज इंटरेस्टिंगली द डिपार्टमेंट इट सेल्फ एज गिवन वन एंड हाफ इयर्स यू टू यू टू पे द टैक्स ड्यूज सो जस्ट टू टेक अपोथेटिकल केस आई मेक अ डिक्लेरेशन टूडे on the 5th of june i have 5th june 2013 i have all the way to 31st december 2014 to discharge my tax but the commissioner has only up to 5th of june 2014 to issue me a show cause notice it's very very long sided and this is where i when i started i said that you know whether we are creating more culprits by this entire scheme but yes we are told that uh, so cause notice has to be issued within one year from the declaration and we can uh, defend it and appeal it as per the normal procedures of the law so just to summarize we are told as per the section there will be a immunity from interest penalty and any other proceedings now what is meant by any other proceedings and this is where one question which kept on coming up was i have some tax dues to pay i pay the tax dues but i have not paid the late filing fees because i have not filed the returns now whether late filing fee is a penalty answer is no it's not a penalty it's not interest so interest and penalty is not wide enough to cover my immunity for the late filing fees for that period so the cbc has clarified no you are given immunity from any other proceedings under the act so late filing fees need not be paid i have my own reservations to this clarification payment of late filing fee is not a proceeding first of all it's a mandatory requirement but the government says anyway it's a beneficial clarification so it will work but this shows the extent to which we are going to give immunity the interpretation of this phrase other proceedings is going to be something which we can keep on talking about for lots of time let's take a very simple example an unregistered declarant registers and declares under vcs he has declared from october 7 to december 12 he has paid the tax after paying the tax can he be issued a notice for intimating that okay i want to now do an excise audit from 7 8 onwards till date can that ea audit intimation be issued i think all of us are very clear no because it's a proceeding under the act can the field officer call him and ask him questions that look i want to check whether whatever you have paid is true and correct can a scrutiny notice be undertaken by issuing summons letters etc now this answer i will divide into two parts till the time the acknowledgement of discharge is issued there is no immunity your immunity kicks in only after acknowledgement of discharge is issued but assuming you got vcs 3 rightly wrongly that's another question that's the practical part of it i don't want to go into that once you get the vcs 3 there is an immunity from any other proceeding so according to me once vcs 3 is issued then nothing can be done and interestingly the scheme and the rules say that the designated officer will issue vcs 3 within 7 working days from full day full payment of taxes so if i am eager to close this issue fast i can declare tomorrow i can pay in two installments but that doesn't mean that i can't pay everything today i can pay the full 100% tax dues earlier also at moment i declare i make the payment of tax dues if i have the financial position take the challenge to him within one week he has to issue me vcs3 i don't know whether within a week time that designated officer has any where with her to check that what i have declared is correct and this is the biggest problem of this scheme it can result in so many complications at the ground level but well this is what the scheme is about as far as unregistered dealers is concerned as i told in the starting the scheme is available both to registered as well as unregistered dealers i am sure what i told you seems scary at least to me as a consultant as an implementer as a balanced professional the scheme is scary and my fright increases when i consider the situation of a registered assessee because the scheme is available even to a registered assc so let's look at what happens to a registered assc's case now for a registered assc's case or even for an unregistered dealer to that extent there will be various issues which are governed by the tax dues 
and there can be issues which are not governed by the tax dues. The question which we have to ask in each of them is whether any investigation can be carried out. For example, I have declared a tax dues of X amount and I gave this example of free issue material. According to me, free issue material was not to be added. So I have not added it. Can later on the officer come back and say that look, you have not added the free issue material. So your calculation of tax dues is incorrect and therefore please pay me the tax. The answer to this would be clearly in the negative unless he is able to say that this is substantially false declaration. If you, that's the handle which they have. If they, if they are not able to substantiate that this is substantially false, you are out. You have issues on interpretation of tax rate, exchange rates applicable, classification. Today, you have many associations who are fighting on the grounds of either mutuality or treating themselves as charitable organizations and not paying taxes under the old regime. With the negative list facing, some of them started paying taxes. But some of them didn't pay tax. And today, or cooperative societies for that matter. Today they take a position, okay, because of the explanation to the definition of service and the detailed clarifications given in the education guide, I am liable only from 1st July 2012. And these charitable institutions declare under this scheme their tax dues for the period from July 12 till December 12. Whether tomorrow, though necessarily under the other than uh, taxable services negative list entry, can tomorrow that officer come back and say, no, you have classified yourself wrongly. This according to me is clubs or association services and you should have paid taxes for all your receipts from October 2007. According to me, again, that is not a handle. Only handle is that one year time frame within which the show cause has to be issued. If that is elapsed, then all of these are matters which get permanently buried. Issues which are not covered by the tax dues phrase, but pertaining to the same period. You might have claimed something as an export of services. Today, use or effective use and enjoyment, Microsoft is pending before a larger bench. You might have taken a view that my services are exempted because I am uh, receiving money in convertible for an exchange. That judgment may come against tomorrow. The question is, at that point of time, if the judgment comes against, can the officer or the commissioner come back to you and say that please pay me this tax? Again, answer is no. All these things the commissioner or the designated officer has to decide within this time frame between VCS 1 to VCS 3 and one year thereafter. If this time frame is elapsed, all recourses are closed. So that same thing applies and in that sense maybe perhaps this is a sort of an opportunity in disguise to identify your compliance of the service tax regime. Even if you are, I would not say that anybody can boast that I am 100% compliant. Even if you are majorly compliant, if you can find some places wherein you were non-compliant, maybe comply with that under the scheme that might give you a benefit even for the things which were actually compliant but there could have been interpretation issues like for example even handling an EA 2000 audit itself is a pain there may not be an issue but if there are certain non paid tax dues and you can go under the scheme you can effectively dwarf off their entire EA 2000 process all the way up to December 2012 and this by itself can also be a huge takeaway for quite a few compliant assesses. So in that sense, I think there is an opportunity in disguise. Just to summarize some tips and traps, you need to be beware of reconciliation issues. And this is where we'll have to see how this scheme actually gets implemented. These are two early days. When you actually go ahead and file a VCS one, what is going to be the back end process at the end of the department? Are they going to demand a reconciliation? Because for the window period between VCS 1 and VCS 3, necessarily there is no immunity. So during that period, necessarily he can't do a coercive steps, but he can definitely ask questions to you. He can issue you a summons and say that please provide me a reconciliation. Please provide me the balance sheet. Please substantiate how you have calculated the tax dues. I think all that powers he very much has. The only problem with the department is ideally all these things should have been a part of VCS 1 as an annexure to your declaration, but it is not there. 
problem in this entire approach then is if the designated officer issues a summons to one person and demands all this information the scheme will see its death nobody else will ever apply so it will be a even for the designated officer it's going to be a cash 22 situation if he does not demand information there's no ways for him to know that the tax dues of 20 lakhs 10,000 which has been disclosed by you is correct and it shouldn't have been 50 lakhs there's no way the officer can find that out because moment VCS3 is done then there's no mechanism for him to question your 20 lakhs if that be the case we'll have to see really how this entire scheme gets implemented knowing the way department works there is also this concern about confidentiality of information and especially if you are a celebrity company or a celebrity professional or a you know many sports persons actors one has to be a bit careful before going in this scheme you never know next day the designated officer might give an interview in one of the media <laughs> and say that look the scheme is a hit some mr xyz who is a celebrated sports person who earned so much in bribes or in match fixing because that will also be a taxable service i presume has declared under the scheme and therefore we are collecting so much taxes one has to be a bit careful confidentiality of declaration i don't think there is any clause i understand that in income tax vds is there was always a commitment if i'm not wrong sanjeev bhai there was always a commitment that the information will be kept confidential those schemes had that but unluckily this scheme doesn't have anything of that type that the information will not be shared so that's again a big problem which one has to look at Pending litigation, especially in disputed matters, one has to carefully weigh whether you want to go into this, especially because it might imply acceptance of tax liability. There's no scope of any refund whatsoever. And the last thing, of course, is the this would be a person who, if he wants to commit a suicide, you can't do anything. But I'm sure most of us won't do this. Before going in the scheme, make sure you have that 100% of the tax dues with you. You, you shouldn't end up with a situation in overseal that you apply for the scheme assuming 50% paid round, 50% one year hai, I collect kar lunga aur dunga kahi se. And then at that point of time you find you don't have that balance 50% to pay. So it will be a suicide to do that. Of course there is a provision which says that the balance amount if it is not paid once declared, it can be collected under section 87 of the finance act. But it is going to be a suicide. So make your cash flow very clear, you should be having, think the entire process, if you don't have the money, think twice before you go in the scheme and make your cash flows very clear at the start. This I think is from my side. I know I have already overshot my time by a few minutes. Uh, a few things as I have already highlighted, especially the immunity part. These are early days and whatever has been explained is my interpretation of the way it is. It's too good to be true. Perhaps it's a little bit unethical and unfair. But we always say, equity and taxation are strangers and in service tax we always found them to be strangers. Thank you very much for a very patient.
There are no tax fees to declare, so you can't declare it. But if you are declare, there has to be a tax fees to declare. In this case, there are no tax fees. The question is that there is a defunct company, dormant company, not having any taxes at all, no revenue, nothing. And returns have not been filed. Whether you can apply for the amnesty, the answer is clearly in the name. Only recourse which you can then take is to say that you are never required to file the yeah, But that would be normal solution, not the practice. Can you find the revenge declaration? Revenge declaration? The scheme doesn't have any specific provision to file a revenge declaration. But if the revenge declaration is increasing the amount, I'm sure people would be more than happy to accept those revenge but they said that declaration should be a two declaration. That is the revised. Then they say that means we are not given a two declaration. But if the second declaration is within the time frame, there is no problem. Then the first declaration is null and void, and the second declaration can be treated as the correct declaration. Now there is another way to do it. You may not file any declaration. You may just write to the commissioner saying that I have declared twenty lakhs, but I thought I should have declared fifty lakhs. He will issue you a notice for the notice under that section three hundred one. Saying that you have filed a false declaration, please pay the balance thirty lakhs. Yeah, even under that so called notice, there is no interest of payment. Okay. What is declaration? Is false certain amount? No, no. The declaration says it has to be true and complete. So if you have two declarations for the same person, both of them can't be true and complete. Both of them are either incomplete in some fashion. No, that is the point. The declaration is not for an issue. It is for the person for the period. And the declaration must be for the entire block. Entire block. Not 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 specific compartments. Again, with regard to that name, name of the company, sure. sound of the group company. Okay. It's as good as one company. If there is a separate company, it's as if it's specific. It's a separate person. But sometimes they are addressing as a group, X Y Z group. So it's not a notice at all. So we have heard that more or less we accept that type of notices. But you can go and tell them that there is no no entity like this. Please issue a notice in the this is the result of the notice of the company. Please issue a notice in that. Can receive a service claim certificate of those which have been paid under this scheme yes. as a service provider? I I could address this issue. As far as the invoices are issued in the normal course. There is no problem because the duty paid document is a normal invoice. Only situation will come where, in the normal course, tax was not collected. A person is paying tax under the scheme and then raising a supplementary invoice. Only in those types of situations, a question can arise that whether that supplementary invoice is an eligible duty paid document. Because Rule 9 says. That the credit on a supplementary invoice will not be available if the tax is recovered consequent to a fraud. Etc. My take on this is that fraud suppression are so strong words that there cannot be a presumption of this. Okay. If the department wants to disallow credit, they have to substantiate that there was really a fraud, which they will never be able to do because there is no investigation. Therefore, credit should be available to the recipient. According to me, there is no reason why the recipient should be paid. Service of the notice, 
you may still have room case for either I know it's simple and therefore I know if I use pending address. Now that service can be a normal service or it can be a test state service. If the person is not available, then there is a process whereby they can paste the notice and minimize it and that is deemed as a valid service of notice. You have to check whether there was service. That is very important. If the notice was served on you, there is a problem. If it was not served on you, Because we are having you that say both the separate separate register and the service ads. So the other is not even from the service. See, it's a way you interpret the provision and I do respect that there can be multiple views. But when you look at the person, will you interpret X-limited mock day and X-limited entry of others to separate persons? Sir, since this team where H-limited is under the chapter 6 of chapter 5, chapter 6 of the Yes, so I am not talking about the scheme only. Yes. And even the service tax law. Under the service tax law, if there is a debit note raised by X limited Mumbai to X limited and the others, assuming they are separate profit centers, will you pay tax on it? Why not? The answers why you don't pay the tax are the same answers which will prohibit you from going to this. That is the way I look at it. There can be a service. Will you pay service tax? If there is a price, if both are profit centers, and there is an internal transfer by the department. So, within the right, we are talking of two separate countries. For two separate countries, there is a deemed establishment pass. But within the same country, will you pay service tax or will you say, no, this is a service to sell? And if that be the case, how can you interpret person separately for charging section and separately for an investment? Sir, I respect this, but having said this, I don't think even that applies. I am not too much of a income tax in Mumbai, but would the domestic transfer price apply in this transaction? Yes, Mumbai to X and the other. Unless they are into ADI or something. So if branch A provides service to branch A, you don't get along. You pay income tax on it. We do deduct tax at source with holding tax. With one branch, uh, with a previous on payments to other branch. I think we'll have to look at it holistically and let's respect that there can be multiple things. I think we'll have to take the last. I have something in the right. I'll just take that up and then move on. Miller is filing his service tax return under the composition scheme. And while uh, filing service tax returns, he has claims and met on his inputs. Whether he can go in and this. I am not onto the substantial issues. I am not going to answer questions whether what he has done is correct or not. So, the question here is something like this a person has uh, paid service tax under composition scheme as a box contractor, but claims segment rate of inputs. And whether he can go in and this. The answer is no, because what he has claimed as credit was not available to him. And therefore, it is a wrong arrangement of segment It is not a tax fee as the kind. Question very there, the department has issued a letter dated 29th of October 2012 <coughs> regarding inquiry on the particular credit. So it's a summons which has been issued regarding a renting service. But they have other taxes, uh, other uh, services under which they want to pay the service tax and I already answered this. Once a summons is issued, the summons is not issue specific. There's a blanket in energy. Even if the summons was issued only for renting, even if the summons was issued only for getting information of TDS and cross matching with your requirement of your know, normal uh, payment of taxes. Once the summons is issued, you are debarred totally. Uh, it is not issue specific. Show post notice is issue specific. So here you will not be able to claim the benefit of this. Sir, sir, the last question. Sir, what about the input credit which is not allowed? The benefit is to the return. Earlier return say 100 rupees, input credit 10 rupees. 
Top 500 rupees, 10, 10 rupees will be allowed. But there is a little bit of any problem. But under this scheme, let's say you have a tax due of 1 lakh and you have input credit of 20,000. What the scheme says is right now you may own that. 20,000 can be away and it can be carried forward and can be adjusted in future period like 2040 or whenever you want to. Cancel the registration then yeah. yeah, if you are a small provider, if you are a small provider, it's not No, no returns to be fine. Immunity from all other possibilities. Yeah. Because then there's no obligation to file the return. What's your business? That's also an opportunity. So, would it not be like if we have to declare the income because it is yet not? No, no, sir. It's about to be for October to December, everything is on display. Each has a clarification at that point of time. As far as you are concerned, there is some tax fees pending. Whether you are a stock filer, non filer, unregistered, all of that is irrelevant. If there are some tax fees and you are not ineligible as for whatever you discussed today, then you should be able to make this. Now, the same question relating to summons. Very interesting question. But then there is no notice issued. What do you mean by conclusion of those things? Let's say you have been issued a summons in 2011, where you have been providing three information, the data balance sheet and say sample sales numbers. You have given all these three things, then you have not heard till they take anything from it. Does it mean it's a conclusion of those things? The answer is no. The inquiry might still be paid. He has just collected the information, he is still analyzing that information. Ideally, he is expected to analyze it in a reasonable time. But what is reasonable in the service sector department is never defined. So, until there is a file noting which says that this information which has been sub uh, submitted has been examined and the matter is closed, they never give a letter service. They never issue letter service. That's why you have a big question. And most of the people would have received that. I'm sure you would be aware of it. Most of the people have received one notice or one letter or something or other. And you need to go and check those file notices. Whether the file is still there and it's there in that long list of proven things. Or is it is it that the file has been scrapped and you said that there's no case and you don't want to proceed? And it, it's very difficult for you to know. That's why one of the questions in my slide was how do you as an SSC you have to apply? But that doesn't mean that the inquiry has stopped. Except audit people, they can defined the process of uh, final audit report being issued. Otherwise, we never did That's true. So, that's why it's a double-edged sword. You need to go to that person issuing the letter or something. And request him and somehow check that is this file closed. And we know the people falls on that. If he does not do that, it's the RTI. See, if the show cause is issued, then the entire appellate court starts. No, but in case he rejects my application, but at the same time he shows a state, can I go against my rejection? No, the point is, when he writes to you rejecting the declaration on the grounds that you are not eligible, they will have to give detailed reasons. Most likely, they would not falter on that. But if you are agreed by that order rejected, there is no appellate mechanism for it. You will have to straight away go to the court. You will have to file a writ saying that it is an abuse of the powers. There was really nothing pending against me. Yet, opposition is taken that something is pending. So, he is expected to file, 
reject the declaration with detailed reasons. Now those detailed reasons you will have to examine whether they are correct or not. If they are not correct, you will have to go to the next question. Is it said in the beginning that SM wanted to motivate people to file returns? So just one question, have you made SAS easy or difficult? With this, I have to propose a well-deserved vote of thanks. Good evening to all my seniors, colleagues and friends. Uh, first and foremost, extremely sorry for all those participants whom we could not accommodate fully. Uh, there are two important announcements that uh, from 14 June to 16 June, Indirect Tax Committee of BCAS has organized uh, RSC at Nashik, refresher course at Nashik, wherein uh, Mr. Sushil Solanki, Commissioner uh, Service Tax 1, was kind enough to present and give a perspective on VCAS from departmental side. So if anybody of you have missed out, please enroll immediately. Few seats are remaining. Uh, on 7th of June, Friday, there is a release of BCAS referencer followed by BCAS family talent presentation. The passes are available. All of you are requested to attend and give encouragement to the uh, talent. Now coming to the pleasant task of uh, presenting a vote of thanks to Sunil, today's speaker. With your kind permission towards my vote of thanks, I may uh, reward VCES in a different manner. V stands for very well, you have presented it very well. C stands for competency, extremely competently and with clarity. E stands for enlightenment, you have enlightened all of us with your insight on the scheme. And S stands for sharing, sharing of the knowledge wholeheartedly with all of us. With these kind words, I request you to give him a big hand. Uh, we also thank all of you for your overwhelming response. Thank you very much.